introductions. My name is uh, Patrick Donahue. Uh, our bios are all online, so we'll let you take a look at it there. And this is? Hi, I'm Phil Pogge. So we're going to try to get a lot done here in 35 minutes. And so we put our email addresses up here. So feel free to follow up and to ask any questions. But today we want to address a concept that really started 30 years ago, and that's around Agile. You know, that was the Toyota Motor Company figuring out better ways, quicker ways to make cars. And now we all know of it really well because we live and breathe it every day in the tech world of agile development. And we're taking those core concepts and we're bringing that into the world of finance and helping people understand how they can be agile with some of the things that have frankly really wasted a lot of time for our entrepreneurs because we need to protect the most valuable asset of our entrepreneurs and that's our time. And one of the things that we'd like to talk about today is the concept of agile financial modeling. For a lot of people that especially don't have a lot of modeling background, this can be a huge time suck. You know, taking way too much time to put together numbers and putting them into an Excel sheet. And so today we want to spend a half hour showing you some best practices and to demonstrate how you can be quick and efficient to build a good enough model in the world of MVPs within 15 or 20 hours so you don't have to kill yourself spending hundreds of hours on something where your incremental return falls off a cliff. So to get started, uh, we've got some pre-canned things we'd like to talk about, but what we'd really like to do is to crowdsource and to hear from everybody what you would like to learn today and what you were hoping to get out of this session. So you speak up, we'll write it down. We don't want to present, we want you guys to do all the work. <laughs> well, what, why, why are you in here? There's a lot, there's seven other cool sessions. I want help and I, uh, I feel like I need to come up with a four year plan, but I need to come up with a short term angel investment. Okay, so the question is yeah. length, length of plan um, and also how to use this for angel investment, okay? We already got something canned for that. Good. Um, what else do people want to know about? Yep. Testing. Testing. Uh, that's another topic we already have uh, given some thought to. So great. Testing. You want to you want to iterate on that at all, or just testing in general, being able to stress test assumptions? Not stress test assumptions. That means stress test the factor, not, not stress test the unit test the model itself. So that if I go up there and change something, I don't have to worry about screwing up the rest of the model because it's, it's, it's fine. Okay. So it's to make it make it scalable. Um, Idiot proofing. Yeah. yeah. That's what I have to do with my models. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes. Business plans. Business plans. Okay. Don't so this. Do them. That's all you have to do. <laughs> Don't do a business plan. Yeah. So we, we, we do yeah. Ad, we do agile business planning these days too. Yeah. So very quickly on that topic, um, I did a business plan uh, last month. And it took my business partner and I, I'm part of another company in addition to what I'm doing with Patrick. Uh, we had probably six to 12 hours into it. And what we did is we made uh, videos. So when people go to our business plan, they click on about half a dozen videos that are private videos on YouTube. And that conveys the full thought of what the business plan is. And so we have you know, um, a long day's worth of work put into it and it, it conveys more because there's that emotional attachment to whoever's um, watching it that they can actually see this passion we have for the business. Um, and it still conveys that same information. We just did it a whole lot faster than we could type. So I, I guess I want to, I'm sorry to a little bit, but so when people keep saying, hey, don't do a business plan, it's not saying, hey, don't do one, it's saying don't do a visual one. Don't, don't write 40 to 60 pages. Exactly. It's okay. not worth your time. Time is your most valuable asset. Yep. Okay. Don't um, ever mistake the need to actually go do the research. You need to go do the research on your business opportunity, whatever the case may be. But the last business plan I wrote was 120 some pages long. It was in the deep ocean mineral exploration and mining business. And I look back at that, that was four or five months of my life that was an absolute waste. Would have been better off grabbing hyperlinks and pictures and putting it into a presentation instead of writing it all out. John. Yeah, 
Right. You know, it's right. Um, so the uh, Mr. Roberts's point is that um, a uh, business plan is great for the thought process, um, but it's not necessarily um, ideal for going out and finding investment. Um, you know, another way of, of thinking about that is the difference between actual real learning and getting an A in a class. So. We think, we think education is going to be disrupted soon, but that's a whole other topic for another time soon. So, uh, Ben, question? Um, research for other something. Great question. Okay. So that's, that's probably plenty right now. Um, so let's get started. Um, we're going to, uh, I'll chat away for a couple minutes and then hand the mic over to uh, uh, Patrick. And so he'll be chatting while we go and uh, actually you can see us construct something real time and, and how quickly and easily um, we can do this. So, um, a agile financial model. Uh, this is also called a pro forma. Um, that, uh, that's, that's another term you'll hear investors say. Really what this is, is a summary of your financial picture on a going forward basis. Uh, the key thing that most investors realize is that a pro forma is always wrong. Uh, and so that's, you know, but that's, that's how it is. The real value in doing this is thinking through your assumptions. That how do you as a business team um, you know, all agree on the direction that you're going and how does that manifest itself out into this business? Um, it serves a giant value in fast failing what you're trying to do. That if you go, you look at it and you realize that it's gonna cost you twice as much to build this as you could hope to get in revenue it's not worth your time. Stop, go find something else to do. Um, you know, so this, this is the value of um, building a pro forma. Um, and the, uh, um, you know, then the question is who needs it? But we think every company should spend a little bit of time with it. And the focus is on a little bit of time. That spend as much time as you need to understand your business, to have something that you can convey to a potential investor and no more time than that. You have better things to do in terms of building and running your organization. And you know, for a couple finance guys, um, you know, we, we can vouch for this, that uh, um, when, we were, when we were applying to um, be part of this, Pat and I tried to figure out how much time we spent working with Excel and building pro formas. Um, and between the two of us, it, it has to be at least 30,000 hours. So don't spend your time doing that. Do something useful, build a business. Um, so to Phil's point here, it's, we'll write up our key takeaways here for you. It's, this is a dynamic document. Never think of a, this is a dynamic document. Never think of this as a finished product. This isn't an exercise to cram a weekend and to have something done and then forget about for six months. Change, change your mindset like you're, like you're doing with your code, right? That you're constantly you know, trying it out, putting it out there, getting feedback, and it's always being worked on. It's constantly being dynamic. And when you change that mindset, it's gonna make modeling and putting together a financial model a little more fun than it's been in the past. It'll be something that's just ingrained a little more into your workflow than in the past. All right. Um, so let's kind of get it, let's start to get into the, um, the how that, uh, for time period, um, most businesses, I think three years is a good way to do it. Um, you know, occasionally you'll see five years, um, and unless you have, you know, a very long guaranteed revenue stream, there's really not a whole lot of reason uh, to go beyond that. Um, spend 80% of your time on the first year's assumptions. Spend 15% on that on that second year, and spend 5% on the third year. So that um, you know, you're really thinking about those next tangible steps that you need to take, and what is it that drives your business. So um, the uh, so the speaking of driving your business, uh, the next thing to think about is econometrics. So when I build pro formas, expect for pretty much every business, I start with some econometric that that drives the business. 
And so it's just a fancy term in economics of, um, you know, a, like a transaction, a customer, a user, something like that that, you, that is the number that's associated with that per unit revenue that is ultimately going to cause the value uh, or, or to generate your revenue number. So, um, you know, the example we're going to use today is, um, Uh, users. So um, here I have a, a quick pro forma put together already, uh, just the skeleton of it. Um, so, and so with users, you have paid users and um, you know, people that maybe they're your beta testers, uh, maybe you plan to give um, you know, free discounts to go drive volume. Um, so go put together this number because um, the way that I always set up my pro formas is when you adjust this number and you have your revenue number right, now, now you're, you only have to change one number and you've changed your revenue appropriately. If you start with, we think we're going to make you know, $10,000 of revenue, now you need to figure out, now you need to go backwards and um, it's too much work. Make it easy. Um, so start with your, with your uh, um, econometric and then um, use that to drive your revenue number. And then as, as we move down, um, you'll have expenses. Uh, some of them will be variable. Others will be fixed. With, uh, um, with the expenses, you know, three to five lines should probably cover your total expenses, um, especially for a young company. Um, if, if you're pre-revenue, really don't spend a whole lot of time thinking about this. Um, go through the exercise to make sure that you're, you know, you're not sending yourself into the ditch right away. But um, you know, you don't know enough about your business to really be detailed about what these uh, these numbers are. Um, but these three lines should capture at least 80% of your business. And then the other part of it is make sure you're capturing all your expenses. That, um, you know, that if, if when you show this to an investor um, and they see that you're not capturing a big looming expense, that's a problem. That, uh, um, first of all, they're going to point it out to you. And if they don't point it out to you, that means they're not investing in you. Um, and more importantly for yourself, Make sure that you um, understand this, that you know, this is one of those, one more thing of keeping yourself out of the ditch. Um, Can you give an example of something you've seen people omit that, you know, if they thought of it, of course they would have Sure. Um, you know, you can sell something for, you know, ten dollars, you're going to sell uh, an app for 10 bucks, and so you recognize that it's $10 is, is what your gross revenue is but there's a 30% commission from the platform you're selling it from. So all of a sudden you have 30% less revenue than you thought you did, and, and that's probably your margin right there. Um, you know, or there's no assumption about office space, and you're gonna have 12 people working for you. So you know, th things like that. Um, you know, and, this, and this happens to the best of companies. I know of an ethanol plant that forgot to include the cost of the rail, the rail loop, which was $12 million. <laughs> Cargill bought that for about five cents on the dollar. They went bankrupt. So to, to Phil's point, just real quick, it's really important when you're doing an agile financial model, you capture all of the expenses. Because those are the things that you can really know and you can really understand. So capture all of your expenses because those are the things you can know and understand, and that's actually going to be a better driver to understand if your business could be ultimately successful or not, because that's going to dictate how much cash is this really going to need. Don't spend as much time, and this is where us entrepreneurs love to do this, because we get big numbers and it gets really fun, and that's why we just left our jobs and all that kind of crazy stuff. But when you focus on the revenue too long, that's where you can spin in a ditch, because that's where you're going to get more into a slippery slope where, frankly, you don't know what the market's going to be to get out there and get some traction. So focus the effort on those expenses and then marry that with this timeline, 80% in the first year, right? Because this, this is the stuff that you can control. 
Don't worry so much about year two, year three. Focus on the things that you can control on the front end. Oh, go ahead, John. Right, and so there's always that fine balance of making sure that you get outside parties excited. So you fall into this trap, especially if you need outside investment. But we would argue that you should really be looking at this, especially in year one, as your internal budget. You know, to think about what are the realistic goals here? Because even if you're fundraising, keep in mind, when you bring these people in, they're gonna be your partners for life. And I've seen more companies get skewered because they had a pretty decent ramp in that first year and they didn't meet expectations. And even though you're a private company, you're much like a public company from investor expectation standpoint where people get a little bit grumpy if they expected it here and it was really over here. So really to make sure you think about that and to temper expectations on the front end. Because one of the key pieces that we teach entrepreneurs about is that people invest in people. And keep that in mind when you're putting together a financial model. People invest in people. For a lot of investors, this model is really a litmus test on who you are as an individual. Are you straight up? Are you gonna tell me the real story? Have you done your homework? Are you coachable? Those are the things that I care about as an investor. And those are things that David Rose talks about from uh, the founder of Gust on his YouTube video. So keep that in mind when you're putting together your financial model on how this is really going to play out and what really matters here. And then in terms of that ramp up, yes, you do have to, you have to sell that long-term vision. You know, can we capture a percent of the marketplace or whatever the case may be? But where I've seen entrepreneurs be very successful is they can throw in a dose of humility in these conversations and say, yes, this is our goal, but we know we're gonna have to learn a lot along the way and stuff like that. So the investor sees you as a person and says, yes, this person is coachable and, you know, I've, by the way, I'm discounting your 2018 estimate by 75% anyways, but I, I like you as an individual, I'm still gonna fund your company. Investors never invest because of the financial model. Let me say it again. Investors will never invest because of your financial model. This is why we teach this. This is why we teach agile financial modeling. You have to present yourself as an individual and just let this be your knowledge flow of how you've thought about your business. There was uh, another question. Um, yeah. Just, so, to say that it's better to overestimate Yes. So, Ben had a question Would it be better off to overestimate your expenses? We would argue yes. And don't get too ridiculous here, but in a lot of times when we put together a financial model, it'll have a line item that's called fudge factor. You know, it's miscellaneous, and it could be upwards of 20%. But overestimate your expenses, because if you're a startup, then you really need $100,000 or a million dollars. You know, time is not your friend. You know, if all of a sudden uh, you thought you had money till December, and it's October and the checking account is running dry, that's going to guarantee more failure than anything else in your business. Right? Doesn't matter how good or bad your software is or anything else. That's what's gonna that's what drives most of our startups out of business is because they didn't have realistic expectations of the expenses. So, um, a way to do that is just your last line in your expense column, make it contingency and make it a percentage of all the rest of your expenses. Um, so as Patrick said, maybe it's ten percent. Um, I have a um, I financed about $2 billion worth of power plants, and we always were expected to put in a 5% contingency, even though we had done this time and time again. Um, and, we, and these projects looked exactly like um, the, uh, the other seven projects that we had just financed and, and were already operating. We still had to put in that contingency because there's things that happen that you don't know about. And as you're doing it for a startup here, you know, there's a whole lot more that you don't know 
So, you know, 20% probably is, is the right number. Um, so you use that as a starting point. And at a minimum, it's, it should make your investors feel more comfortable because you do have your eyes open. And, you know, you, it shows that, that you understand that there are costs attached to running a business that, um, so that's what I have. We would, our, our, we would really have to focus on that first year. And once again, sticking to this, you know, don't worry about it so much year two and year three. You know, for, if you're dealing with purely a startup, and we're speaking as if most people here are startups, but this could be applicable to any size businesses like Phil talked about billion dollar power plants. But for an early stage startup, you've got one goal, and that's to meet some big major milestone. For most of us, that's probably some SaaS-based subscription. I need a thousand subscribers paying paying this for my product. <coughs> that's my milestone, and so that's where you have you focus 80% of your time on focusing on the modeling that's going to get you to that milestone. And so I'd worry about that, and don't you so much worry about so much year two and year three, because frankly, if you don't hit your milestone as a startup, you got other problems anyways. And the extra five hours to have thought about that is a waste of time. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah. but if you're doing a, say, a big power plant, they're probably not going to be built in that first year, so you're not going to show any revenue, you're just going to show, is it just one year cost, lots yeah. of cost? Right, in a power plant, in energy in a power plant and project based like mining and stuff like that, vastly different. When I, when I put together our model for a mining operation, not only did I spend a lot of time doing it, but we spent $50,000 hiring other people to do an Excel model to help us. And that's how much time and effort and contingencies you need to build to be built in. So that's like a whole different, you know, that's a whole different type of type of world. You know, it's kind of like you need a WordPress site or you need to build the next Facebook, right? Um, so it all depends on what camp you're in. But for 99% of us, it's it's the, the WordPress version, you know, something quick and easy, getting us to a milestone. Do you have anything to add? Um, no. I have nothing to add. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, should we talk a little bit about this? Okay, so let's actually go through, and I, and I put together a template for um, uh, building a pro forma. And um, so first thing, start with dates across the top. So this is the, the very practical hands-on nitty gritty. Um, I suggest that for the first two years, you do it on a monthly basis. And then that third year, and if you go out to five years, um, consolidate that and do it on, a, um, on an annual basis. That that's, that's about as accurate as you really need to be. Um, so here, for our example, we're talking about users. Um, this is you know, whatever econometric you think is appropriate. Um, so starting with, the, with users, I just assume that there was 500 additional per month. Um, be careful about using um, something that is you know, like a 10% growth rate per month um, and where you carry that out for uh, more than a year that you can end up with some huge numbers and um, you know, in, investors love to see a hockey stick in actuality, not on their pro forma. And there's no hockey stick function on the keyboard. <laughs> so um, so here's, here's our users. Uh, unit revenue, let's just assume that this is $10 per user and, or per paid user. So then our gross revenue is going to be paid users times the unit revenue. And we'll copy that across. And then our expenses. So let's, let's assume there's a 30% uh, variable cost for revenue. Uh, labor, um, we're going to skip that one for a second. Office and hosting. So once again, you put uh, the variable expense, that 30%, once again, that's going to be your cost to sell whatever that piece is. So for most of us, it's probably a 30% commission we're giving up uh, somewhere in the food chain.
financial, and so that's where most SaaS-based companies that uh, put together a financial model, we actually like to have paid and unpaid users in there so we can capture that because we're moving into an era where you're, you're getting a lot of credit for having huge unpaid user bases, you know, because everybody looks at the Facebooks and so forth to get started, but then there is real costs associated with that, so uh, you do have to capture, capture that as well for most of us. This stuff is a little fuzzy. We can keep the, the, the conversation dynamic and so forth. And we'd be happy to email you the, this model, uh, uh, this uh, this model to you afterwards if you want it. Uh, but you know what we really want to demonstrate here is just how quick and easy this can really be. Now we're trying to cram this in in the course of 15 minutes, but uh, the reality is is that you know, if you give this five, 10 hours, 15 hours of your research and how much can you sell something for your unit cost, you're gonna be in a very good position. And what we want you to walk away with is that 21st, 22nd, 23rd hour, you're gonna stare at a financial model or your team, it's probably not a good use of time anymore. Tell them. How do we, uh, how do we get, get, get the financial model? We just email you? Yeah, email us. We'll also, uh, we'll put it out on like Google Docs or something too to make it easy and maybe link it to, to uh, put a tweet out or something like that too. We actually are building a dynamic financial do, uh, a, a dynamic financial model that somebody will be able to go and answer a series of questions. It'll spit out a model to get people started. So that's why we wanted to do this today. We're probably 30, 45 days from launching that. That'll be pretty cheap for people to get them started. Do you advocate um, using uh, ranges to you know, rate conflict confidence intervals and that sort of thing? And if, if so, how do you, how do you show that in your model and convey that to investors. Right, and so we don't we don't have this here today. I'm glad to like to see you can type it away and show people. I just thinking it, it might be e easier to convince people if you know that you're within that column of right. uncertainty rather than having them interpret are you, you know, three months into it, are you ten percent, are you twenty percent over or under what, where your where your fixed line was? So a key to an agile financial model is to spend the time on the front end to make an inputs page in wherever you can to put a number in that's gonna help drive other numbers. So when I did that $50,000 financial model I talked about for the, the mining company, we had a whole page that was 300 lines long that was inputs that drove the entire rest of the model. And that was, we spent a lot of time and effort up front because there were eight other pages to the model that you wouldn't touch at all. You would only touch it on the inputs. And so that way you could email it to people and they could be a little bit self-directed in their ability to go in and play with the numbers. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very important to set that up on the front end. For a lot of us, if we're an early stage business, getting into too much of the weeds to try to make it this big bulletproof model with the inputs all perfect on the front end, probably is not worth it. It's probably a little bit better like what Phil is doing here just to get the thing moving and rolling. Um, and then finally, there's a sensitivity table that you can that you can do that basically says if this assumption is differentiated by um, five percent, ten percent, fifty percent, here's what the outputs would look like over here. And so that is those are all pieces that can be built into Excel and are highly recommended once a business is up and going and you, you really need something more robust than probably what we're talking about today. Yeah, I would, I would add two parts to that. One is um, that, that sensitivity analysis. Uh, you can use scenarios um, within Excel. That's a great tool. Um, but it takes a little bit of time to set up. Um, but it makes it very quick if you want to go click between, you know, here's our base case, here's our high growth, here's our, our low growth uh, cases. And it's, that's very quick. Uh, the other thing that you can do is you can create a log page um, or that's my term for it, that's not a specific term, that goes and attracts um, the different uh, results that you have for your different cases and take that, copy it, um, paste as a value and so it shows the different scenarios and you can go and compare those. Um, I tend to orient them so that uh, each case is a column and then you have the same 
um, rows that are linked. Um, so set up a, 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 a column that is linked to the cells that you want to capture. Copy that column and paste it into your different scenarios. So then you don't have to go back and recreate um, how this is done. Uh, so it's, that's a quick way to, to run a host of different scenarios. But, but you're saying useful, that's not over investing too much time. That's, that's you're, you're, that you're getting, times, you're getting close you to it. take a variable and say, well, you know, I'm not going to get too picky about whether my user onboard rate is going to be this or a hockey stick. Yep. But I know it's going to be within a certain cone and I can defend that. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. You know, and, and that's and that's something where um, you know you can make a uh, make a graph and show you, you know most most investors want are most concerned about um, uh, the revenue line once once after you get past the assumption of you know, we've we've appropriately captured all of our expenses so then you can you know show here's our high growth scenario here's our uh, medium you know our base case here's our low growth scenario. And so you see on a graph, you know, very quickly what that is, and you don't get bogged down in, in the numbers. John. Um, you know, if you're going to use these financial modeling for basic money, uh, after the bill, I'll throw this up to you. If you want to finally start to capture the macro basis research on what drives angel investors, and after you ran on, half of it is who the person is, and only less than half. Absolutely, um, you know, and that and that kind of comes down to uh, some of the last points that we wanted to make um, about uh, testing. Um, have somebody look at this other than just yourself. That you you know you spend enough time building this that you probably you know if you made a mistake you you looked at it so many times you're not going to notice it. So go have another member of your deal team look at it. Um, Go have your advisors look at this before you take it out to investors. Um, you know, if you get other people to validate um, a that that it works, um, that you know formulas are, are calculating correctly, you don't have any circular references, um, uh, and b that your assumptions are reasonable. That this is a great way to go and, and talk about the business um, uh, with with a investor, and, and, and again, approach it with a little bit of humility and say, hey, you're the first person to look at this. Help me beat up on the model, just don't beat up on me. Yeah. So, one, one thing we'd like to point out is, and we, I've seen with so many companies <coughs> that the investor takes the model and then they go play with the numbers themselves and they come up to their own conclusions what years three, four, five, and six look like anyways. And so that's why what we really want to convey to our entrepreneurs is that it's okay to have the base case of you know this three-year model and not to get too hung up on you know years three and beyond because the reality is a real venture capitalist and a real investor they're going to take some time to be thinking about it themselves and they're going to have their own set of numbers and it's not well worth it for you to spend five six ten hours on that long-term scenario anyways so we're almost done here so let, let's wrap up so you have your model created um, one thing I would point out here is um, do something where you can track the cash that you have. So you have your beginning cash, your cash from operations, your cash from investments, and that'll give you your ending, ending cash. Your ending cash starts your beginning cash for the next month. Go and look at how much cash you need. So in this case, um, when you add up all the negatives, you know this says that you need about $90,000 of cash. You probably want to have a little bit more cushion than that. Um, when I build my models, I always make um, blue numbers are input cells, black numbers are calculated on that page, and green numbers are linked from another page. So if you set that up very consistently, it helps you edit your models faster. Um, and then, so so let's, let's wrap this up. So you have your pro forma built. How do you share it with 
an investor. First of all, um, summarize it. When you put your pitch deck together, show your um, just show your annual numbers. That you know, here's the first three years, um, five years, whatever whatever you ended up doing, and um, you know you really only need to have a few lines. You need to show you know they're interested in when do you get to profitability, or when do you need to go have your next round of investment. Um, yeah, your your ability to speak intelligently to that is going to be more important than a beautiful model. You know, it's your ability to speak to how much money is it going to take to achieve X milestone. You know, what is it going to take for us to break even to have an intelligent discussion about that? Yeah. Um, so as you're visualizing this in, in your pitch deck, you, know, you really have four columns. You have your, your row label, you have the three years, and then your, your rows, um, you know, you need your econometric, um, your revenue, your a couple uh, um, uh, expense lines, that, especially your big ones, so that you're capturing eighty percent of the of the amount, um, and then that other line, and then if there's any margins that are appropriate or you know time to, to cash flow break even, um, your assumption about next investment. That's that's the next things that you need to have in there. So we're, I think our forty minutes are up, but we're we're here. Larry, you have another question. You know, again, it goes back to the econometric of, you know, your sales that, you know, maybe instead of 500 per month, it's actually, um, you know, one per month, and they're every four months is the is the timing. Um, that's that's how you would you would express that. But it doesn't have to be a smooth line for growth. That if you know there's, you know, seasonality in your business, um, you're going to sell more in the summer than you are in the winter. Um, you know, reflect that. Yeah, that's a good psychological trick when you're dealing with investors, is to make it choppy and to show big sales of random months or whatever the case may be, because that, that shows people that you've actually thought about it, and you had some reasoning behind it, versus if it's truly, like Phil said, if you've got just a 10% growth rate baked in here, the thing goes like this. As an investor, that's a red flag for me. That means I'm gonna have to dig in and really ask this person a lot more questions, because they just plug a number in here for it to go like this, because no business does that. So we try to cover a lot of ground today, but if you get one takeaway from this, please, please, please do not spend more time than it's necessary on financial modeling. Look for other people to help. Figure out the quickest and easiest way to do it, because we need to protect our entrepreneurs' time on what matters most, and that's building the business and not getting stuck into things like financial models.